Welcome to another episode of Something Rhymes with Purple. This is a podcast presented by Susie Dent, the world's leading lexicographer in my book, and her groupie friend and admirer, Giles Brandreth. Uh, Susie is based in Oxford. In years gone by, she used to work for the Oxford English Dictionary. She's now well known in the United Kingdom and beyond as the person in Dictionary Corner on the daily word and number game countdown and in the comedy version uh, which is called it's got a funny title the comedy version of countdown hasn't it what's it called well it's called eight out of ten cats does countdown it is slightly strange but it's because it's a mashup of an existing comedy show called eight out of ten cats and that itself is based on an ad for a cat food brand which was something like eight out of ten cats prefer it so it's got a sort of long slightly torturous history but for those of us who are on it we just call it cats down much simpler. cats down well that's Susie Dent I'm Giles Brandreth and my claim to fame if I have one is that when I was a member of parliament many years ago now in the 1990s as a private members bill I introduced something called the 1994 marriage act And this was the legislation that enabled people in England for the first time, if they wanted a civil wedding, to get married in a venue that wasn't a register office. It's thanks to me that if you're listening to this in England, you can now get married in a stately home, a historic house, a wonderful castle, a hotel, somewhere unusual. I made that possible. So today we're going to talk about weddings. But before we do, I've got Mm. news to bring you, Susie Dent. Because here we are talking every week about words and language. And a few weeks ago, I mentioned to you that my friend, the distinguished British actor Peter Bowles, uh, was yeah. emphatic that he knew that the origin of the word digs, as in a digs list where actors go and stay, came from a person called Diggs. And you... With an E, right? With an E. And and you suggested that as far as the dictionary was concerned, from what you knew, it probably came from actually diggings where you you got dug in and where you Mm -hmm. you stayed, either a military term or... Anyway, not from a person's name. Is that right? Is that the background to it? Yes. There's no mention of a person's name in any of the etymological dictionaries that I have looked at yet. Peter Bowles, I'm pleased to say, and I had lunch this past week. And he arrived with a copy of Boswell's London Journal, 1762 to 1763. Uh, uh, Peter Bowles is a, a, a keen reader and admires the work of James Boswell, who was mm-hmm. the famous diarist, author, who recorded the life of Dr Samuel Johnson, the pioneer mm-hmm. of the English dictionary. Not the creator of the first dictionary, but perhaps the first really famous dictionary, Dr Johnson's dictionary. Anyway, James Boswell, who was Scottish, kept a journal. And in this journal, on the 19th of November, 1762, he records uh, an encounter with a man called West Diggs. Great name. His full name was West, W-E-S-T. His surname was Diggs, D-I-G-G-E-S. And I've looked into this man, West Diggs. He did exist. He was a a leading man in the theatrical company based in Edinburgh. Indeed, I think he'd long been Boswell's ideal of manly bearing and social elegance. He was especially captivating in a range of roles, but noted for his appearance as McKeith in The Beggar's Opera. Anyway, uh, let me read this from the diary. I got from Diggs a list of the best houses on the road and also a direction to a good inn at London. The point is that this man, Diggs, had a list and kept a list of places where actors could stay. He travelled around the country, and his list, Diggs' list, became quite well known, as evidenced from this diary entry of the 19th of November, 1762. So I am saying, and Peter Bowles is saying, and indeed James Boswell is saying, that the origin of the theatrical Diggs' list is West Diggs, Scottish actor of the 18th century. Can we pass this information on to the Oxford English Dictionary? Of course, I absolutely can. And I'm just looking back up in the um, OED and looking to see the very first date that Diggs, as in lodgings, is mentioned. And it is 131 years after 
that entry. Yes! That, that really, no, it's 131 years after. So, I no, it's actually not a kind of yes, oh. because you would have thought that if it did come from Diggs List, it would be there in record quite a lot earlier than 1893. You'd have thought that if they which, knew what they were doing, but clearly these people don't well, know what they're doing. Yes. Yes, no, so it's quite possible. First first reference here, 1893, from Stage magazine. Being in the know regarding the best digs can only be attained by experience. But, uh, you know, who knows? My mind is always open because we're always antedating words. We're always finding new evidence of, you know, earlier records of words. So I will definitely, thank you, Peter, I will definitely pass this on to the offices of the OED. It's intriguing stuff, isn't it? It's always, I, I love it. I just have become quite a party pooper over the years because some of the very, very best stories attached to the etymology of words turn out to be wrong. But this is absolutely fascinating. And as you say, there is written evidence of this, so I will definitely pass it on. And before we get back to weddings, there is something I would like to say, which is that we had the most wonderful gift arrive with us in the post, which fits with the kind of celebratory theme of today, but it was to honour our 100th episode, which we marked earlier this year. And it's from Susan Bramble in County Wicklow in Ireland. And she runs a text art business called The Word Bird. Anyway, she gave us the most amazing framed collage made up of titles of our show. So you will find Ugsome, Lalochesia, What the Dickens, Scurry Fungs, Fobbly Mobbly, Cram Basils, you know, all from my trio of words. And it is just Beautifully done with a star, purple star in the middle. We are hundred today. Thank you so so very much, Susan. It's um, it's really something to treasure, and that's definitely going to go up in my study. Furky Toodle is still my favourite. Wonderful. Furky Toodle. Well, that fits with today as well. So, to Furky Toodle, if you remember Victorian slang for a bit of kissing and cuddling and a bit of a preamble. Yeah, a bit of a preamble before the big day, weddings. <laughs> now. Lots of people are going to be celebrating this summer, uh, especially in the UK, where it's been announced that the restrictions on weddings have been lifted. So that's why we're going to talk about weddings. I imagine around the world still different rules in different parts of the world. I know we've touched, I think, on honeymoons in the past, mm -hmm. stag do's. We covered those in our episode called... What was it called? Spal Spalolalia. <laughs> and Spalolalia is actually not particularly relevant to weddings because it's flirtation that goes absolutely nowhere. <laughs> flirtation that, that gets you nowhere. I like that oh, word. Oh, yes. You haven't been watching a programme called Too Hot to Handle, have you? I haven't. That's all about... Should I? No, you don't need to watch it. I've only caught it because okay. I've been doing a celebrity goggle box and they show oh, yeah. us things that would make... If I had hair, it would be standing on end. And one of them is called It's Too Hot to Handle, where basically it's a show all about uh, spell... Uh, say it again? Svalolalia. Svalolalia. Well, how does it yes. make up that word? Yeah, I have to say that it is one of those words that's a kind of fanciful coinage based on Greek. So it, there's no way that you would have found this anywhere wow. in, in Greek. So it's from svalo meaning to stumble and lalia meaning talking. So it's actually linked to that lalochesia, which is the use of swearing to let off steam. Well, so it's flirtatious talk that you might yeah, you might enjoy, but it doesn't go anywhere. It, well, that's exactly what happens on It's Too Hot to Handle because basically okay. it's young, hot people lusting after one another and then discovering that... They can't touch. Uh, that there's a so hundred thousand pound prize, but a bit of snogging costs you a few thousand. Oh God, that sounds bizarre. Yeah, it's completely ludicrous. Uh, but there mm. we go. So let's get back to okay. nuptials. Oh, nuptials. What? What's the origin of the word nuptial? Yes. So nuptials uh, goes back to the Latin nubere, meaning to to wed or to get married. And that actually also um, gave us the word nubile. I hate the word nubile. Always used of girls, sort of young and sexy and things. But originally it just meant she was simply old enough to marry. So there was nothing about attractiveness in it. There's something slightly sinister about the word nubile today, I find. But anyway, those are nuptials from the Latin for to wed. And nuptials means wedding. What's the origin of wedding? I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? We, I think we talked in our Sphalolalia episode about how weddings often linked to the idea of being yoked to somebody. So you are wedlocked, holy wedlock. Wedding simply comes from the old English wedum, which meant the same thing. And we think it goes back to a Scots word meaning to pledge. So it's the idea of pledging yourself to someone. The people at a, a traditional wedding are the bride and the groom. 
What's the origin of the bride and the groom? Uh, Old English again. So in Old English for the Anglo-Saxons, a bride was a a B-R-Y-D, a breed. And the bridegroom, nothing to do with the word groom, actually, because the original form was breed guma, and a guma was simply a man, and it was a slightly poetic word for a man, so that by the dictionary will tell you that by the end of the Middle Ages, people wouldn't have recognised the word guma. But it simply meant a bride man, so the person accompanying the bride, i.e. wedding, marrying the bride. And so instead of the the guma, given that they didn't really know that word anymore, they substituted, as we so often do, a word that they did know. So they put groom in instead because it sounded a bit like groom. And bridal, I think we mentioned this before, bridal shows that people have always had fun and partied at weddings because it comes from a bride ale. So the ale here was ale drinking. It was a wedding feast where lots of strong stuff was drunk. Bride and groom. At Mm. gay weddings, now you have bride and bride and groom and groom. I think we need to extend and improve the vocabulary. Yeah, language seems to be moving a bit slowly in that context, doesn't it? I'm I'm with you on that one. Uh, when you get married, you cease to be a fiancé, which is a French word, isn't it? Being affianced, being engaged. Yes, that's again, it's the idea of pledging or a fiance is a promise. And that goes back to the Latin fidere, meaning to trust. And that gave us fidelity as well. And these are just actually two French words that we've adopted. Fiancé with one E and an acute is the male version. And a fiancé with one E and acute and then a second E is the female version. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely right. And French kind of percolates as we always say through our language in so many different ways you will find rsvp on your invite and your invitation people hate invite by the way and actually while we're on this you know when people say oh invite i bet this is an americanism and we have talked before about how unfairly americanisms get treated in english um, or british english mostly because they're not actually americanisms anyway but i'm going to look up here in the oed when invite as a noun first came about 1659 so it's been around for a very long time even though people don't like it and actually it was from french it's mentioned in a book by Monsieur Lestrange, and it's a, a French text. So there you go. And RSVP is simply répondez s'il vous plaît, isn't it? Reply if yeah, you please. Yeah, répondez s'il vous plaît, please reply. There's a lovely quote in the OED from 1834 where people are puzzling over these initials. RSVP. And it says, now, my lady, do tell me the meaning of this word in the corner. It has puzzled us all at our house exceedingly. RSVP. My mother says it's a French word, but I think it's no word at all. I think it is what they call initials for a regular small whist party. (laughs) Oh, I love that. (laughs) That's That's joyous. And this, of course, is because the language of diplomacy and the language of haute cuisine. Ceremony. And entertainment was the French language. Yes, so it was the elite. every menu was printed in French, uh, whatever country you were in, and invitations would they be sent? And well, obviously they were. Parties. No, they were, I don't think they would be in French, but it definitely gave you a certain je ne sais quoi sort of flair, and you know it was the the language of the elite, which is why it infiltrated the law so much, and you know various kind of aristocratic pursuits such as hawking and um, you know hunting and that sort of thing. So it was definitely a, let's be as cool and as posh as the French. Brides and grooms have been around for hundreds of years, I know. When did the best man and the maid of honour, when did they come into the the show? Yeah, I don't know much about the... You'd have to get the sort of marriage um, historian for that, really. But the idea of the best man was around for a long time. But best man is, I think, comes after best maid. And these were originally Scottish. So best maid, the chief bridesmaid at a wedding. That's 1766. Best man, the actual sort of, you know, linguistic formula, if you like, of the best man came into English in 1782. But I think the words or the idea themselves were around, you know, far longer than that. Good. At a wedding, too, you have people showing you to your seat. It used to be brides' guests on one side, grooms' guests on the other, seem to remember. I can't remember which Mm. side was which. And you were shown to your place by an usher. Yes, and the primary function of an usher originally was to be a doorkeeper because it goes back to the Latin ostium, which was a a one word for a door. So they would let people through the door and then the duties of an usher extended to showing people to their seat. Then it was an assistant schoolmaster and then the idea of assisting someone at a wedding, that was originally American and that arose in around the sort of late 1800s. So at the nups, the traditional nups, the Mm. bride is dressed in white and she wears a veil 
What's the origin of veil? A veil is from... You're putting me on the spot here. So um, that is from the French voile, which was uh, always used for a woman's garment, whether it was the headdress of a nun or uh, sometimes it was a curtain, but the idea always is of, of kind of concealment. So you're veiled until the moment of revelation when the veil yeah. is lifted and the groom faints uh, because he's getting married <laughs> to the wrong person, doesn't like what he sees, or faints because he's overwhelmed by the brilliance and beauty of the, the bride before him. She's got a train to her frock. What's the origin yes. of train? That's interesting. Yeah, train. So this is all about trahere in Latin, which was to kind of pull or kind of pull along really which is why you get on a passenger train and you have a retinue that is a train and you have the train on your wedding dress it is kind of dragged along behind you if you like trahere also weirdly gave us tractor i remember one of my daughter's weddings they got all the the sort of ushers and the best man to be wearing the same uh, colored ties and pocket handkerchiefs and cummerbunds Mm. Uh, what's the origin of the word cummerbund? So a cummerbund is from Urdu and Persian. So it was something that was brought back in the early 17th century. So this isn't from the British Empire, this one. And a cummerbund is kama meaning waist or your loins and bandi or bandi meaning a band. And it was a sash apparently formerly worn in India and the Indian subcontinent by domestic workers and office workers. And it was very much a kind of symbol of status, uh, of quite low status in those days. And then, of course, it's, you know, in, in terms of its fashion in the Western world, it's actually become you know, quite a sort of ceremonial, you know, sort of form of display. So it's kind of moved somewhat in its social aspect. The bride traditionally carries a little bouquet or nosegay. Mm -hmm. uh, bouquet, is that the... Bouquet. bouquet is the same word for fragrance, isn't it? it you say it a wine has yes. a wonderful bouquet and it's... What, what's yeah. the origin of that? Actually, interestingly, it comes from the French meaning a little wood. Oh. It comes from, uh, well, in fact, in Italian, a boschetto is from, it means, li again, little wood. And it's linked to a basket, which is a small bush or a shrub. So the idea, I guess, is something sort of natural. And a bouquet was a bunch of sort of wildflowers originally, a nosegay. And that's how it came into into the language and interestingly it came into the language in the diaries of Lady Montague who we must talk about at some point because she wrote some quite sensational letters telling us about the pursuits of young aristocrats in the 18th century oh yeah I, love, I, like, I like that sound of Lady Montague I've not heard of her <laughs> she was, lots of scandal um but yes and we have have the tuxedo. Do you wear a tux quite often? Do you like wearing tuxes? This is an American word. I would tuxedo. I can't. I mean, what's the notion of a tuxedo? A tuxedo is an evening outfit. Why would people be wearing... So you'd just say dinner jacket, I would, I would say a dinner jacket. I wouldn't wear a dinner jacket at a wedding, in, in England anyway. I know yes. it's different in America. If you do it right. Uh, I think in Britain, if you get married, it's a formal wedding. Mm. Men would wear, if it's going to be very formal, they would wear a morning suit. Um, not yeah. as in mourning the dead, but mourning as in daytime mourning. Am I right? Yes. The origin of that is simply it was a, a smart suit that you wore in the morning. Absolutely. Um, yes, and it, has, it was. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but in America, they seem to get married, I don't understand this, often in tuxedos, uh, mm. even if it's during the daytime. I suppose it's because it's smart attire. A tuxedo is what I would call a dinner jacket dinner suit. Yes. And if you look back, actually, there's sort of quite a, a sort of royal aspect to this as well, because if you go back to the um, latter years of the 19th century, the Prince of Wales at the time, Edward VII, was fitted with a rather special garment. And he had a tailor in Savile Row make this sort of bespoke ensemble that was more casual than a tailcoat, but more classy than a lounge suit. And thanks to him, really, the dinner jacket became one of the hottest ticket items in tailoring. Uh -huh. And it was brought back to the US by admirers of the prince who wanted to look suave and sophisticated. And in 1886, the first jacket like this was worn to an autumn ball under the name of Tuxedo because the ball was held at Tuxedo Park in New York. And Tuxedo itself is quite interesting. It's a Native American term from... It's an Algonquian name and it's thought to mean meeting place of the wolves. But that's gripping. Extraordinary that everyday word tuxedo is actually named after a place and it was because they were wearing a fashion made popular by the Prince of Wales, Prince of Wales. who later became Edward the Seventh. Yeah. Well, that's a real Anglo-American story, tuxedo. You never know, tuxedo. do you? Explain to me the difference between a buttonhole and a corsage. 
Okay, so buttonhole traditionally is a uh, a flower. I don't know which kind you choose, worn in the um, literally the buttonhole on the lapel of a man, traditionally at the wedding. A corsage originally was the body of a woman's dress. So it was a, a bodice and it actually goes back to the Latin core, meaning a body. So it began as a bodice and then became a bouquet that was worn on the bodice. And that wasn't around until sort of late 19th century and it seems to have begun in um, America. But yeah, so that's the corsage. I think traditionally women will wear the corsage. I mentioned the 1994 Marriage Act, the legislation that I introduced, uh, though I have to say, when my wife heard me once being described on local radio as the expert on the Marriage Act, she almost fell off her bunk laughing. <laughs> but marriage, we haven't actually, we've touched on nuptials and wedding, but the word mm. marriage, what's the origin of that? Yes, well, once again, we have uh, French to thank for this. So marriage is from the Normans, mariage, and that goes back to marier, meaning to marry. And I think it's to, uh, originally it was to kind of to bring a dowry to something. So I think a dowry, as in something financial that you would bring to a wedding, was involved there as well. But ultimately in Latin, maritus was the husband, marita meant married. So it's, it's got classical origins. And dowry? since you brought that in? Mm. Dowry is from the Latin uh, dare, meaning to give. So dowry meaning the money or property normally that a wife brings a husband. But yeah, it goes back to the Latin uh, for giving, uh, essentially. Yeah. You know, giving to somebody else. There was, no, there was no dowries when I got married, but that's neither here nor there. So is there anything else we ought to touch on on marriage? Oh, yes, one more thing. And then we'll have a break. We haven't discussed what something that's now disappeared but used to exist when I was a boy. People often talked about a shotgun wedding. Are you familiar ah, with that expression? Yeah. Well, I, I've always assumed, I've never really investigated this, but I've always assumed it was the idea that because the woman was pregnant, that her father or or the father of the of the father was holding a shotgun to their head saying you've got to get married and that's how I've always interpreted it but genuinely I'm not sure of the origins of you know the exact origins so I'm going to look this up as I always do 1927 originally a US yeah wedding made in haste or under duress by reason of the bride's pregnancy um 1927 doesn't really tell us more than that well, but I, I mean I think I, it says it all sure. it's fairly obvious isn't it Susie when we were talking about bouquets and corsages, I mentioned the word nosegay. I don't mm. associate it particularly with weddings, more with those little bunches of flowers that judges traditionally used to hold, I think, because it was to keep the sort of stench of the plague away from them. That's that's what I'd heard about it. But what is the origin of a nosegay? Yeah, well, gay in this sense is, as a noun, is used for... It was used in many, many different ways, but um, uh, also for anything that looks bright or showy. So it was an ornament, especially one that was used to amuse a child. So the idea is simply was that a nosegay was something that actually gave pleasure, and in this case it gave pleasure to the nose. So... It was a bunch of flowers or herbs that had a sweet smell and first mentioned in the 15, no, yeah, 1500s, as you say, I think in days when maybe personal hygiene wasn't quite so feasible, it quite necessary, I would say, to carry a nosegay. And of course, the Queen carries a nosegay everywhere as well. I'm not sure for the same reasons. Tell me about, we must have discussed this before, but remind me of when gay came to mean uh, homosexual, because gay as a word... Um, meaning uh, cheerful, merry, bright, the bright, lively looking, all of yeah. that goes back, as you say, hundreds and hundreds of years. I think gay for uh, as a word for homosexual is actually older than we might think, and has been in use since Victorian times. Yeah, so as you say, it's had quite a sort of journey, this one, this adjective, because it meant carefree, uh, the gay science was the art of poetry, um, and it had a sort of brief spell, like so many adjectives, I have to say, meaning wanton or lascivious. And then in around the 1600s, it began to mean dedicated to pleasure, so dissolute, promiscuous, hedonistic, of a woman it was living by prostitution. So you've got all of that kind of, you know, slightly sneering background to it. And then around the 1920s, you start finding it meaning, you know, gay and this, homosexual in the way that we would interpret it today. But, you know, it, who knows? It's quite difficult to sort of look back anachronistically, really. But, you know, quite often you will find 
and this sort of, you know, slightly nasty history behind these words. Good. Excellent. Very interesting. Actually, if we haven't done one, we must one day do a gay slanguage episode of Something Rhymes with mm -hmm. Purple. Yeah. If you have subjects you'd like us to talk about, do please drop us a line. You can communicate very easily. We are purple at something else dot com and something is spelt without a g and purple people do communicate week in week out and uh, thanks to Susie Lou spelt l w for clearing something up for us she writes dear Susie and Giles love the show thank you just thought I'd let you know where Gully was last week oh and attached is a picture of a Croydon lamppost announcing no parking Gully cleaning in progress <laughs> and that's very funny. Excellent. Very good. Oh, it says between nine and three, which is pretty much his working day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> gully, that's G-U-L-L-Y. That means a kind of ditch, doesn't it? A gully. Yes, it does. Uh, absolutely. Related to gulch and that kind of thing. Not related to our lovely Gulliver. Very good. Gulch, as in the Wild West. So and so, a gulch. gulch. Come. OK. Yeah. What correspondence have we had this week? Well, we have more wonderful shop name puns. No episode of Something Rhymes With Purple would be complete without our brilliant shop name puns. We are running a competition. Do you remember? It's nearly time to pick our favourites. This week's contenders includes Ian Wart, or Wirt, from uh, Guelph in Ontario. I've probably completely mangled all of that, Ian. I apologise. But his favourite tennis shop in nearby Oakville is called The Merchant of Tennis, which is brilliant. Genius. The Merchant of Tennis. Justin I love it. Mendel from North London has a local florist called Floral and Hardy. Very and good. And finally, this one doesn't qualify because it's not an actual shop name, but following on from our recent camping episode, Terry Glacier, a purple person from Bodrum in Turkey, has nominated a camping shop that during a sale placed a sign outside that read, this is brilliant, now is the season of our discount tents. Oh. That's excellent, isn't it? Oh. I think I've seen a picture of that on... Um, That's brilliant. Media. That is a, a pun based on the line from... King Richard the Third, the play by Shakespeare, isn't it? Now is the yeah, winter of our, the of our discontent. Now, it's absolutely oh, brilliant, it's and I think we'll reveal our favourite shop name in next week's Ooh, episode. So, so we're stay have tuned. To start debating this. We have a question now from Andrew Beck, who he says, due to the pandemic, lots of plans for weddings and parties have been put paid to. Why do we put paid to plans but nothing else? What does put paid to mean? Thank you, Andrew, for that. Well. The sort of best theory is that it comes from the practice of bookkeepers putting paid on bills when the paperwork for a sale was done. Not particularly old, so early 20th century. So that's our best guess, is that it actually is a financial term and um, if you put paid at the bottom of a bill, you are settling it. So I think the idea is that you then are putting paid to something you are settling it, but, you know, obviously in a sort of slightly negative way because it's always putting paid to... Usually positive plans. So thank you, Andrew, for that one. Thanks. Matthew Bell has been in touch and writes, My better half is from the great county Tyrone, specifically the town of Omar. My question is, what is the origin of the word Marleypot, M-A-R-L-E-Y-P-O-T, used in context, you've a head like a Marleypot, meaning befuddled, confused or foggy? Conversation around the table seems to indicate this is uber local, even specific to the town or village. It was used by the grandmothers, generally farmers' wives, if that's a help, and has been kept alive by the second generation town. We'd hate for it to go out of use. It rolls off the tongue so well, especially in the accent. I won't attempt an Omar accent, but the word is Marleypot. Yes. Well, I've done a bit of digging with this one. I had to, and I'm hoping I've got this right. But Marley seems to be a variant or an alteration of marble. So oh. a kind of slang shortening of the word marble. Marble, as in the small balls of the children's games, you know, the sort of glass, beautiful little balls quite often that you play marbles with. And in the game, players shoot their own marbles inside a ring or they try to knock other people's marbles out of the ring, etc. And some people lose some of all their marbles. And the idea behind marbles as a term for someone's mental faculties and losing your marbles comes from that idea. And if you look up Marley in a dictionary, you will find that Marley is actually used for both a marble but also someone who's foolish or stupid who has lost all their marbles. 
And pot is just kind of added on as you might find balm pot, which is another term for somebody who's just a bit soft headed. Balm in this sense is the, you know, if you're balmy, uh, the idea of, of a balm pot was somebody who was a bit frothy uh, in the head because the balm in brewing is the froth that you might get at the head of a pint of beer. So the idea is you're a bit frothy. And it's the same with a marley pot, is that you're just a bit stupid or foolish or soft in the head. But I think it all goes back to the idea of losing your marbles. Great. Well, thank you, Matt Bell. That's brilliant. Uh, do please keep writing to us and uh, we'll endeavour to answer your queries. Um, Susie is so brilliant. And if she doesn't know it and she knows almost everything, she will I dig up the I answer. Will look it up. Absolutely. Yes. And you communicate with us by simply dropping us an email. It's purple at something else.com, something without a G. We're also, I think, on Instagram and we're on Twitter. Some people communicate with me directly to at Giles B1 on Twitter, and I try to forward it to headquarters, purple at something else, so we do get round to everything in due course. Now, we're going to get round to your trio of words. Three unusual, interesting, but real words. Sometimes people say to me, oh, she just makes them up, doesn't she? Uh, you don't make them <laughs> well, up, do you? Well, it's funny you should say that, because actually I was going to start off with a word that's not not officially real. I mean, there's just, you know, any word is real. We can just create any word and it, it exists. So when people say, oh, it's not a real word, they think they mean it's not in the dictionary, which is seen as the a final arbiter of, you know, whether a word exists or not. But I'm going to show you, Charles, I'm not sure if I've shown you this mug before. It's not from our merch. It was... Uh, given to me by my sister can you see that and yes. it is just a word that i relate to quite often it's a coffee cup but this one says pro caffeinating and i think i've mentioned this Ooh. before because to pro caffeinate is to put everything off until you've had at least one cup of coffee so it's a riff on procrastinate it's not a real word but I just look at this mug every day and it tends to be what i do until the coffee percolates into my brain so that's the first if people will forgive me that one the next one is in the oxford english dictionary and it's lovely conjubilant Conjubilant. Hopefully, if anyone is getting married this summer, this is what they will be. It means rejoicing with others. Conjubilant. If you remember, con felicity is sharing in the joy and happiness of another person. Conjubilant is rejoicing with them, which I think is lovely. And finally, I don't know if you are like me, I am always looking for a book that I know has the information I need, but my shelves are slightly packed and I can never find it. And it is simply introvable. And introvable, I-N-T-R-O-U-V-A-B-L-E, means not capable of being found. And the dictionary will says specifically of books. Introvable. It's like uneatable and inedible. I mean, uneatable yes. means inedible. Inedible means uneatable. So unfindable is introvable. Introvable. But using yes. trouvé in French is, is, uh, is defined. defined, so it's from the French, introvable. Th that is a brilliant trio. You are a brilliant person. Um, oh. I do think you are. Well, we've been talking about uh, weddings and marriage and nuptials, in which case I thought that I'd end with an alternative uh, poem to share. A friend gave it to me, and it's one of my favourite poems, and it's not about love, mm -hmm. it's about friendship. It's called Friendship, and it's by Elizabeth Jennings. Such love I cannot analyse. It does not rest in lips or eyes, neither in kisses nor caress. Partly I know its gentleness, an understanding in one word or in brief letters. It's preserved by trust and by respect and awe. These are the words I'm feeling for. Two people, yes, Two lasting friends. The giving comes, the taking ends. There is no measure for such things, for this all nature slows and sings. Oh, I love that. Who is that by? A poem about friendship by Elizabeth Jennings. Brilliant. Well, thank you, as always, for listening to us. We are very, very grateful that you have, and we love it when you get in touch um, by emailing purple at somethingelse.com. Something Rhymes with Purple is a Something Else production produced by Lawrence Bassett and Harriet Wells with assistance from Steve Ackerman, Ella McLeod, Jay Beale and... Hmm, that one on the sign. What's it called? Yes. Indeed. Only works Cleaning between nine in and three. Yes, absolutely. Cleaning in progress. Golly.